Hey, how's it going? I'm Clink. You may recognize me from my ever popular role in the hit YouTube web series, Waifu Adventures. Did you know that I'm actually a person too? That's right, and like most people in the world, I just experienced the year of... And I have quite a few things to say about it. But, for the sake of keeping the video short and concise, I'm only going to talk about my thoughts on the state of video games. So, just like a real YouTube video, here's my thoughts on 2015 in gaming. Oh, look at that. It's, it's like an official intro and all that jazz. As you may know, the beginning of 2015 didn't really give us many outstanding titles. At least, that I got around to playing. The Wii U was still a dying console with only a hint of promise of recovering after the first two years. We were graced with Kirby and the Rainbow's Curse, a pretty decent title that, while not my favorite game of all time, was certainly charming. I think that's the word. Meanwhile, the 3DS got codenamed Steam. No. No, that's not the right Steam. I feel like I should say something about the game. Eh, this is only good, so... Namco continued to churn out yet another Dragon Ball Z game, but this time, YOU get to be a part of the experience. Actually, I sort of enjoyed this game. It's not really a good game, but... I don't know. It's in this segment. I liked it. This is the good segment. Jeez, I I'm writing this... <laughs> not you guys! Stop, stop judging me! And of course, let's not forget Square's attempt at selling more pre-orders for Final Fantasy XV with the release of Final Fantasy Type-0 HD, a game I only bought because of Final Fantasy XV. So, guess they did their job well. Note, I actually enjoyed this game once it got past the overly sensitive- OH GOD! What is that?! Why did they think this was okay?! The second quarter brought us a few good games like Puzzles and Dragons Z, a game which was only made to sell another Mario game. And the international release of J-Star Zuki vs Plus, a game which was only made to sell more issues of Shonen Jump. And then Quarter 3 had Tembo. So I'm, I'm just skipping that. <laughs> Quarter 4 brought the Wii U back to underwhelming form with Yoshi's Woolly World and Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival. <laughs> I just wanted Animal Crossing. <laughs> what are you doing? 3DS got a new and possibly final installment of Chibi Robo that, well, let's be honest, no one actually bought for the game. It was it was just for the amiibo. Look at that little cutie. Also Zelda, 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 three times Zelda. What is Zelda was a girl? Zelda. Triforce Heroes is one of the most aggravatingly fun games I've played all year, and despite feeling like a huge departure from the series, because it was one, needs to be experienced at least once, especially if you're a Zelda fan. It's not great though, and that's why it's here on the good list. Just like Dragon Ball Z. No first. You know, while there were plenty of really scummy things going on behind plenty of AAA companies, cough, cough, Konami, I can't say I actually played many bad games this year. Sure, there were some huge disappointing games like Fallout 4 or LEGO Worlds, but nothing I could truly call bad. Like, take a look at the spreadsheet I'm using to keep tabs on everything. I have a bad rating, and I only use it once. Right there. Hey, hey me, blur out, uh, blur out which game that was. So instead of talking about bad games, let's just jump ahead to the award for the most disappointing game of the year. Drum roll, please. The game that's the bad one, it's the, it's it's Batman Arkham Knight. Batman Arkham Knight. You see what I did there? I said bad. Could have possibly been one of the best games of the series. The gameplay was fun. The story is a mix between the Nolan films and the comic books. You know, before it got all dark and edgy. The openness of Gotham truly felt immense. But with Batman feeling more versatile than ever, it could get around places. I need to just change how this sentence is- I'm, I'm changing it right now. But with Batman being more versatile than ever with traveling, it made it feel large but easy to navigate. It was great, except the PZ port was a load of garbage. 
I struggled to complete my 30 plus hour playthrough of the game on PC with terrible frame rates and the game just not closing after I'd end playing session, causing me to need to restart my computer before it completely blew up. It was awful, it was terrible, I nearly cried. I think I actually did cry. But hey, at least you didn't pay any money for it. Actually, you're right, me. The award goes to Persona 4 Dancing All Night because that was a huge disappointment. <laughs> Am I right, everybody? Persona 4 Dancing All Night? Because <laughs> I actually had expectations for that. It's just, 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 just so stupid. Now's the fun stuff. Stuff I really love. Emphasis on the fun. Let's just get right into it. No real order, no real structure. Just me and the games I deemed great or fantastic this year that are really worth mentioning. I'm also going to make a fun count, so every time I use the word fun, it'll show up right there. You may call it lazy writing, but I call it consistency. Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate was the most fun I had with a portable game this year. Hunting Monsters was great, and while the only other game I played in the series is Monster Hunter 3, I can say that this game did a much better job at getting me involved with the series and want to continue playing. It was so beginner friendly, while also being something new and fun for veterans of the series with the jump mechanic. It's great. I loved it. Meanwhile, Splatoon was the most fun I had with a shooter this year, and possibly ever. With a continuous release of free content in the form of maps and weapons, this game continues to bring me back for more inky fun. A stupid line, but I'm like, still keeping it in. I don't know why. Witcher 3 is a game I haven't put nearly enough time into. Like, like, just take a look at how many hours I have on Steam. I'm basically cheating putting it on this list. But I had so much fun with the short amount of time I put in the game that, that I just had to put it somewhere on this list. And also, VGA gave it the Game of the Year award, so I'd, I'd sort of be doing the game a disservice if I didn't include it. The combat was great. The world's huge, and this is something, something about the story. I, I don't, I did actually didn't put enough time into the game to tell me what the story was about. But hey, I still love the game. I enjoyed LEGO Jurassic World as a major guilty pleasure. Subconsciously, I've always wanted a game where I can free roam Jurassic Park, and to my surprise, there hasn't really been a game that does that. It makes all the more sense that LEGO would be the one to finally make that happen. Also, customizing your own dinosaur is fantastic. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Just look at that guy. It's probably my favorite LEGO game ever, except maybe LEGO Island. I'd love to see those two games cross over. <laughs> that would be fun. Look, look at Pepper go. He's being chased by that dinosaur. He's gonna get eaten. Actually, on second thought, it's, it's probably dumb. I don't really know. Well, Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer isn't the new Animal Crossing game I wanted. <laughs> I will say it's one of the best innovations brought to the franchise. I love designing people's homes and creating dumb stories for each of them. I love how easy they made furnishing, and it's all things I'd love to see included in a new Animal Crossing game. I see this game not so much as a full game, but more as a tech demo for what could be in the next game, and that's just fine by me. People bought tech demos for games for steep prices before. Just look at the MGS Ground Zeroes. People ate that shit right up. <laughs> Speaking of MGS5, The Phantom Pain, while not the best of the series from a narrative standpoint, nor that complete of a game thanks to Konami's interference, is probably my favorite game of the series from a gameplay standpoint. Every time I pick up the game, I find myself getting completely engrossed and just saying, just one more side op, or, oh, my development project finishes up in 18 minutes, I'll just play until that happens and then call it quits, but then I keep going. Maybe it's because I get to listen to Katamari music while I play the game, or maybe it's because the stealth mechanics are the most refined I've ever played from any game in the genre. Or maybe it's just because I love Fulton and guys, weapons, and vehicles out of the bases without anyone finding out. It's a lot of fun. Xenoblade Chronicles X is a game I can't put down, except when I play other games I can't put down. It's always a chore to actually start up my Wii U, but when I get the energy to do so, I can't stop playing until the gamepad says, I die. Please, no gamepad! I'm playing Xenoblade Chronicles X! The combat brings everything I love from playing Final Fantasy XIV, or, you know, any generic MMO, into a fantastic single player experience with hundreds of hours of content. It feels great to do anything in this game. Find a new location, plan a probe into the earth, defeat giant enemies, complete missions, rank up the friendship meters, get new gear. Oh, oh god, there's just so much to do. 
and it all feels really satisfying to, to just do it. The story is also really good too, so I don't think this game is all just funning uh, games. You get it? Games? This is a video game. Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege is the first big AAA shooter I picked up for my PC, and I don't regret it for a second. While it's definitely no Splatoon, I will say that uh, it's a lot of fun. The community is great, and planning behind group teamwork is great. And for once, it's nice to have a shooter that actually rewards careful planning and cautious movement. The destructible environments are more than just gimmicks, but are actually an important key to strategizing, and that's great. Even the single player mode, which goes for a no actual story approach, is great for training newcomers like myself and getting them accustomed to the flow of the game. It's great. I, I love it. I say I love it at the end of all these because, uh, like I said, consistency. Or it's a lot of fun, or it's great. I, I end every single one of these with that because consistency. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Clink, where's the best game of the year? The game that everyone's been clamoring about. The one that's the biggest game in the history of the world of gaming. Where is that game? Well, since you asked for it, here it is. Undertale is the best overrated game of potentially all time. While I don't think it's the second coming of Gaming Jesus, I do have respect for what Toby Fox set out to create with this game. The writing is top notch, and while I don't particularly think the characters themselves are that great, the setting and subtle ways the game plays with the player's expectations is fantastic. The fact that the gameplay lends itself directly with the narrative is something that almost no RPGs ever do if you can even truly call this game an RPG. I don't, however, think this game is the best game of the year, though. That title goes to... Bloodborne! Uh, if you know me at all, you saw this coming. It's Bloodborne. Bloodborne is the most addicting game I've played all year. It takes everything I loved about Dark Souls and throws it into a blender and hits puree, turning what was once very defensive combat into quick thinking and on-your-toes encounters every step of the way. I love the subtle delivery of the game's story, I love the setting the game takes place in, I love how much the game just doesn't care about your feelings and throwing incredibly tough bosses at you, but most of all, I love the complex level design, holding oodles and oodles of secrets around every corner, encouraging exploration. Each weapon lends its own unique style of gameplay, and the amount of armor you can find in the game gives you plenty of options for customizing your character to be the most handsome prince and slash or beautiful princess. Even the recently released DLC, The Old Hunters, brings something new to the table and is very reminiscent of Dark Souls 1's DLC, which is great. I can't think of a game in recent memory that has given me more joy after overcoming an almost impossible obstacle than this game. This is probably how many people felt about Dark Souls 1 when it came out, a game that I personally enjoy but don't love like everyone else. For me, this is that game. This is the game that I consistently want to return to. This is the game that sold me on the PS4. And this is the game that is my game of the year. And if you have a problem with it, then make your own video, because that, that, that's why I made my video. But you're watching right now, it's you! So at risk of alienating my non-existent fanbase any further, I'd like to take a step back and do some honorable mentions. I couldn't talk about them during the best segment, mostly because a lot of them were either ports or remakes, or I just didn't have a lot to say about them. So let's just go through the list in one nice montage. 